in the beginning of the movie Fiddler on the Roof, they break out into this song about tradition in which they sort of admit that they don't really understand why they do some of the things they do. They just do them because tradition! <laughs> And in many ways, that movie is about the collision of tradition with emerging new and modern and progressive ideas about the modern world. But from that opening song, it would be easy to conclude that tradition is something that we just, we kind of blindly adhere to without ever employing our reason or our critical thinking. It's this lazy reliance on a way of life without ever really challenging ourselves to think for ourselves or to progress to something better than our ancestry would allow. It's a mark of fear and ignorance rather than encouragement and enlightenment. And there could be some truth to that. There are some traditions that we inherit that we blindly follow simply because they are traditions. But does that make the alternative more prudent or discerning? If we're going to answer that, I think we have to we have to confront the fundamental question of what a tradition is, what tradition itself is, and why tradition exists at all. And I would answer that question by saying that tradition is what happens when practices, beliefs, knowledge, wisdom, technology, culture, and a way of life are passed down from one generation to the next. And that raises the question of why we would invest so much energy, so much effort, so much human resources and and financial investment into ensuring that these goods that we have would transfer from one generation to the next. I would say that that's so that our descendants won't have to unnecessarily solve every problem that has already been solved. If we make discoveries and acquire knowledge and customs that are of a clear benefit to us, then if we are a good society, and if we love our fellow man, of which our descendants are included, we would want to ensure that they don't have to go through the same trouble danger, sacrifices, and difficulties that we had to in order to overcome those adversities. If we've already managed to map out certain landmarks of the human experience, it would be an evil and cruel society to withhold those the content of those discoveries from future generations. And I spoke about this in a, in a more recent video where I said that the whole reason we have education is to transmit knowledge and culture to future generations, which means that the work of education is inherently part of the process of a living tradition. And to my regret, it seems like a lot of people misunderstood what I was trying to say in some of these past videos and, and the more recent one as well. I'm not saying that there isn't room for innovation or even authentic progress. There is. But the only way you get progress is by building upon the existing work of your ancestors. You have to first inherit what they have to offer, become intimately familiar, you have to become an expert in it, frankly, and then build on from that point. If every generation insists on going back to the starting point of where their ancestors started from by disregarding the tradition of their ancestors in the name of progress, then that's actually one of the least progressive things you can do. The other very anti-progressive thing you can do is to change for the sake of change because progress is only meaningful if you have a vision of where it is that you're progressing towards, which is only possible if you can articulate what is good, true, and beautiful. But if you insist on conflating change with progress, then what happens if you're on the right path and in the name of progress, you change? Well, obviously, that's not going to be progressive at all. And this is the analogy that C.S. Lewis uses. He talks about it as if we're headed towards a destination, that progress means moving closer towards that destination. But if instead of actually progressing towards it, we're constantly changing our direction, then it's more likely that we will just go in a futile arrangement of circles. And again, that's, that's not progress. If we truly want progress, we have to accept whatever good our ancestors have given to us, and then we have to build upon that. But that starts by recognizing the good that exists within our heritage. But unfortunately, the wokeness and false progressive progressivism of today is only able to recognize what it hates about our heritage. And that's a recipe for going backwards or for continually starting over. And again, that doesn't lead to progress. So we need tradition to avoid wasting our time trying to solve problems that have already been solved. And if we have any hope of building something better or progressing further, it comes with a catch. It means that we have to honor and we have to trust our ancestors. G.K. Chesterton said it best when he said that tradition means giving votes to that most obscure class of all, 
our ancestors. It is the democracy of the dead. Tradition refuses to submit to that arrogant oligarchy of those who merely happen to be walking around. It is a concession that our ancestors' voices and wisdom should still be heard today rather than disregarded because they lived in the past out of some fallacious notion of progress that requires rupture with the past. Donald Kingsbury said that traditions are solutions to forgotten problems and that if you throw away the solutions, those problems will return. We tend to take for granted the peace and prosperity that we've inherited because we don't know the kind of adversity that our ancestors had to overcome to provide it for us. But if we assume that the tradition we've inherited is bad simply because it's old, we may discover that those old problems we had no appreciation for because we've never had to face them will return. And then we won't know how to overcome them because we were protected from them by a tradition that we've now discarded. That means that tradition often is something like a blind trust in tradition or in our ancestors and the wisdom and knowledge that they, they passed on to us. G.K. Chesterton used the example of something like a fence. He said that modern reformers will often look at something that exists and they'll say, I don't see the use of it. Let's, let's just get rid of it. But saying that you don't understand the use of something could be the same as saying that you don't understand what it is or why it's there. Humility demands that we should look at something that was built prior to us and say, there may be a reason for this that I don't understand. And destroying it may have a whole range of unintended consequences. But arrogance compels us to simply discard it because we didn't build it ourselves. So yes, there is a kind of a blind trust in following tradition because of the admission that we are in many respects blind. We don't have the firsthand experience of the problems that our ancestors faced. And so we have to trust in the solutions that they developed unless we, for some ridiculous reason, think that we should unnecessarily face those same problems again ourselves. But when people ridicule those who adhere to tradition as a kind of willful blindness, it leaves me wondering, what is the alternative that you're offering here? Because it seems to me like it's just more blindness and probably a worse kind of blindness. If tradition is like a map that we've inherited that tells us where is safe to go and where isn't safe to go, then yes, accepting that map and following it requires a certain kind of trust in those who gave us the map. But to just throw the map overboard and insist on charting a course of your own, that's not a kind of visionary lucidity. That's a worse kind of blindness. It's the arrogant refusal to listen to those who have already explored lands unknown to us because we don't want to accept somebody else's help. A person who trusts in the accumulated wisdom and knowledge of a civilization and their ancestors will have a much clearer vision of their surroundings than someone who refuses to listen, listen to that knowledge simply because they didn't discover it themselves. The former is a path to vision, enlightenment, and true progress, whereas the latter is a path to isolation, regression, and ruin. And unfortunately, it's that latter sensibility that seems to dominate the trajectory of the modern world. And so if we have the courage and the fortitude to do so, we might want to take an inventory and ask ourselves, how is that working out for us from time to time? And while we may be able to point to a, a vast arrangement of creature comforts, which can be said to have improved our material prosperity and well-being since the Industrial Revolution, which, by the way, was a low point for human health and well-being, there is this increasing persistent sense among people that far from getting better, things are actually getting worse. According to the World Happiness Report, in, sp in spite of dramatic increases in material comforts, Americans report stagnation or even decline in happiness since 1972. And according to the Best Countries Report, of all respondents, 60% uh, agreed that things were getting worse. Take something like the absolutely catastrophic collapse of the family since the sexual revolution. And of course, the sexual revolution was another example of our enthusiasm for progress under the pretense of disregarding the wisdom of our ancestors, which was seen as backwards, antiquated, and unnecessarily prohibitive. So we embraced promiscuity and we continue to march into every dark corner of the closet of human sexuality in order to liberate any inhibition that we might have about it. And we don't seem to have a very clear appreciation for the effects. We don't talk about it very much. It's not something that ends up in our sex ed curriculums, but it is something we should be talking about because since 2004, over 5 million people have died from HIV AIDS in America 
alone, not to mention the tens of millions who have died from it globally. By 2004, they were recording over 500,000 deaths a year in the US and 1.7 deaths globally. That's per year. Nobody was locked down. Nobody was forced to wear masks. Nobody was forced to social distance. And nobody with enough influence to actually change the course and trajectory of our culture thought we should admit that the sexual revolution might have been a mistake. We refuse to admit that there might be a moral or a behavioral solution to this problem. Like, I don't know, going back to when things weren't this bad. And so we, we just waited around until medicine and technology and science would provide a solution to prevent all these deaths from happening, which didn't happen for decades, which meant that tens of millions of people died while we waited for that, and instead of telling people that maybe promiscuity isn't good for you. Or maybe we should talk about the breakdown of marriage, which is vital for the upbringing and well-being of citizens. Divorce destroys the financial well-being of families. It creates untold misery for spouses. And the effects on the children in those families is are crushing. All the positive outcomes that sociologists and psychologists look for in child development are severely di diminished by divorce. A child's mental health, their performance in school, their ability to secure good employment, and the, their ability to stay out of jail, all of those figures plummet when a father isn't present in the home when they're growing up. In fact, most potentially shocking of all, a lot of the literature shows that kids do better when one of their parents dies as opposed to when their parents get divorced. And again, this is easy to trace back to the sexual revolution. Everyone knows that the, the, the divorce rate has skyrocketed since the sexual revolution. And it should come as no surprise to us that in one study, 60% of respondents said that the, the final straw for them was the infidelity of their spouse. I don't know why this is so hard for us to understand, but a culture that promotes promiscuity is going to be in tension with an institution that depends on fidelity. It has to be the most incoherent burden that we put on people when we say, be sexually, sexually liberated, but also unfailing monogamous for the good of society. Dare we even mention abortion? 60 million abortions since Roe v. Wade in just the United States alone. In 1960, about 3% of whites and something like 22% of blacks were born to unwed mothers in the U.S. Now it's something like 30% for whites and 70% for blacks, which is a lot of kids who are going to grow up without having access to their fullest potential. How about our level of sophistication in the way that we communicate and our social decorum? Try reading a letter written by your average 18 or 19 year old sent home to his family or his sweetheart from the trenches of World War I and then compare that to the kind of correspondence you might see between someone who is romantically interested in someone else today. It goes from some of the most touching and courageous content, not to mention the level of literacy and writing, to today where the best you can hope for is something like a cheesy pickup line on Tinder, but you'll probably only ever end up with something like this. Or how about art, music, and architecture, which all peaked 100 years ago. Now we're supposed to think that something like this is sophisticated, or that this is an environment that, that promotes human flourishing. We may be increasing in technology and material comforts, but I would say that we are decreasing in every measure of what it means to be a human being. And in case we fail to notice, the only reason that technology has continued to progress is because we rely on a tradition known as science. But even now today, that is suffering attacks from woke thinkers who want to divest society of everything that has traces of whiteness and patriarchy to it, of which science is now on the chopping block. Thanks for watching. The reason I can continue making content like this is because of the generous support of my viewers. If you feel called to support this work, then consider joining the Reinforcements, which is my online community. There are multiple tiers, including free access for those who can't help financially, but still want to join. You can join up at www.brianholtworth.ca. Certain levels will also get a free gift basket from Glory and Shine, who is a family-owned Catholic bath and body products company, whose beard balm I'm wearing right now. It's like aromatherapy for your face.
Even if you don't join, they make amazing products. So check them out at gloryandshine.com. And don't forget to like and subscribe. You don't have to agree with everything I said to get value out of these kinds of conversations. So be sure to subscribe to be edified or challenged. There's value in both.